There was this old kind of aqueduct in the very back of the cemetery by the boundary wall to the north where Oakland met Berkeley. In the really wild part, no one could see. We liked to sit on the cracked old pavement of the now defunct waterless place above an empty reservoir stuffed full of brush that had been discarded by some lazy landscape artists beyond the thinnest of slates of rocks with skulls and crossbones on them where the oldest inhabitants of the place lay. No one carves pictures of winged skulls and crossbones anymore. It's too morbid or something. All of Mother Nature was back here, reaching up and around us toward a touch of sky above. We liked to watch the sun turn red here when we first made out years ago in a little magic of reminiscence, any sadness falling off us with the last bits of light. Then reluctantly we would kiss the sky and return back to our bikes fashioned out of random parts to take us wherever we wanted to go. The Imperial was not far off, near the MacArthur train station, west of which followed the sun to Emeryville and Oakland's port and industry, and all the big rigs waiting in line burning gasoline. South was Lake Merritt, Alameda, and Fruitvale. North was Rockridge, Berkeley, and the University of California with all its checkered history. Government labs up in the hills by Relies Valley Road. The Hayward fault was hot and ready to open up and swallow the whole damn thing, really. Wildcat Canyon hugged the hillside, taking you to heights and vistas overlooking all of the bay and the Golden Gate. I was hoping Kel would return to the Imperial, but there was no sign of her there, either. Just some stuff she left behind. Makeup she had boosted. Some clothes copy of Nylon magazine, a chain, and the apricot boots I gave her. Kel, where the hell are you? Bless didn't know anything. She was upset too, but more upset that I was upset than anything else. She didn't know Kel like I knew Kel. She never said so, but I think she sort of dismissed her for a junkie, so it's a good thing she didn't say so. She lay on the motel bed, on her stomach, and watched me casually go about the business of being distracted by my worries and prayers and thoughts for our little sister. She had her own distracted thoughts and questions, like, when would I come around to my goddamn senses and get with the sweetest girl around? She wasn't going to be waiting around for me forever and would have put a clock on it. But what good's a clock when time cannot contain us? She was watching me like a hungry woman watches her wife prepare dinner. And I liked the way she watched me. It made me feel all tingly. Her head rested in the cradle of her arms, folded under her on the soft motel sheets, swimming in ambient seas.